Christ, it is good to be here with you in God's house this morning. We'd like to welcome our visitors who are here with us today. It is truly an honor that you're worshiping with us, and I pray that you would come and be with us again very soon after worship. Our worship service today is divine service setting one. It begins this morning in the front of your hymnal on page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess out our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silent confession before our God. Let us confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you. And for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing together today the words of the instrument, found written on the instrument in the bulletin. Help, 
save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Syria. 
and Jua, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jua put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jua shall Elijah put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have been bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from here, from there, and found Elijah, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the twelve, or twelve. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go, go back again, for what I have done to you, or what have I done to you? And he returned from following him, and took the yoke of oxen, and sacrificed them, and boiled, the, boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose, and went after Elijah, and assisted him. For the, for the word of the cross is, is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will pour. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through, through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, to save those who believe. For, for Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
they say that we continue with the singing of our next hymn.
Father. These are the words of our Lord that we meditate upon this morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I will most likely never be a good fisherman. I honestly can't remember the last time I went fishing, which kind of tells me something about my dedication. If I do go, I take whatever equipment I can find laying around, which is the stuff that I've been using since I was a kid. I'll use whatever bait I might be able to find. I don't know when the best time of day is. I don't know what kind of bait to use. And honestly, if I catch a fish, it's just a lot. Now, Peter. Peter, he was a professional. Surely every time Peter would go out, he would do the exact right thing, and he would have some success. That would be the expectations, but look at Peter's statement today in your gospel lesson. He says to Jesus, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. Now, by human standards, Peter had the exact right equipment. He had the right boat. He had the right nets. He had good partners, that whole thing. He had the right knowledge. He had gone out at the right time. He had worked hard, and he got nothing. Now, it doesn't say in the Bible, and this is just my own personal opinion, but I have a sneaking suspicion that Jesus, the Lord and creator of the whole universe, redirected the fish that night to make a point to make an impression upon Peter the next morning. You know, up until this time, Jesus had been on his own preaching the gospel, proclaiming the good news of the king. But now, on this day, by his will, by his preparation, his solitary ministry is about to come to a quick and dramatic end. <clears throat> you know, one of those God things. Now Peter and the others, they had already known Jesus. He was famous all over their town. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us he had already been to Peter's house at least one time before, and there he had healed Peter's mother-in-law from fever. But now Peter and his friends, they've been out fishing all night, caught nothing, they had their boats up on the shore, they're off washing the nets, and here comes Jesus, and he's preaching. He's preaching from the shore, and there's so many people who want to hear the word of God that Jesus is proclaiming, that they're crushing in on him, and he's got nowhere to go, he's going to get his back to the water, so he asks Peter to let him get his boat and go out into the water so he can preach from out there. And Peter lets him get in the boat, and they go out. And Peter sits there, I imagine, while Jesus does his preaching, and gets that wonderful opportunity of hearing Jesus again. And again, I have a sneaking suspicion that Jesus, the Lord of the universe, is looking for something. You know, Peter probably thought, hey, this is a good opportunity. I let Jesus use my boat, and that kind of evens up the score between me and him, you know, you know he and my has a different motive. One more important than just kind of evening up some kind of favor score between him and Peter. And then something happens. Everything. I mean, everything turns around on these words of Jesus. He looks at Peter and he says, put out into the deep and let down your nets for it. Peter must have thought this was crazy. This made no worldly sense at all, Peter. It's the middle of the day. The worst time to be fishing there on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, if they hadn't caught anything in the middle of the night, which was always the best time, then how did this carpenter, this itinerant rabbi, think now? In the middle of the day, it was a better time that things would work better. It just didn't make any sense to Peter. 
and let out into the deep water? We're net fishermen. Net fishermen in this area, it always works better in the shallows. It's pretty lame advice Jesus is giving them. But again, I got this sneaking suspicion that Jesus, the Lord of the universe, knows what he's saying. And he knows what he's doing. And nevertheless, as crazy as this sounds, as crazy as what Jesus was saying sounded, as opposite as it seemed to the established way of how things were supposed to work, Peter responds, okay, but at your word, Lord, I won't let down the nets. So he drags them in off of the shore where he's been cleaning, puts them back in the boat, they go out and they let the nets down and contrary to worldly wisdom, on Jesus' word alone, this eminent disciple does what seems crazy to him. And what's the result? And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. Did you hear that? Following Jesus' word, Contrary to everything that seems like wisdom and experience, the result is unbelievable. When such God things happen, like Peter, who saw this amazing thing happen, we realize how wrong we are, how wrong we've been to depend upon ourselves, to depend upon the world. We realize how smug, how arrogant we've been. And in doing that, how we've belittled God who things our way. He's got kids. But this amazing thing happens and you see Peter's reaction. It says, Peter falls down before Jesus and he exclaims, depart from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man. The raw power of God brings us to where we need to be. Off of our self-made pedestals, face down at the feet, at the feet of Jesus. The sinner dare not remain in such holy company. And so Peter begs the Lord, please go away. I have no right. To be anywhere near you. And he was right. But Jesus doesn't leave Peter or any of the others, or you or me, terrified. Do not be afraid. That's what Jesus tells Peter. Do not be afraid. The most beautiful words that we can hear from our loving, forgiving, all in Savior. When we are terrified because of our sin against Him. When we are terrified when we realize how much we have placed ourselves before Him. Our natural and correct fear of God because of our sin and our arrogance though are erased by those beautiful words of love and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus. Do not be afraid. Jesus has used His almighty power he has directed and controlled his creation from sun to water to fish to men for his divine purpose. And it is that purpose that we heard about a few weeks ago. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And that saving was done completely by him through his life, through his death through his resurrection. And that salvation is for all the world and it is received by faith. And the scripture says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So the message has to go out. The message must go out of saving faith. And it is delivered in that message. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. 
These are the words for all of the followers of Jesus Christ, from the apostle to the pastor, to the lay people sitting in the pews. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. You have already been caught. You have been caught in Jesus' net by the fishing of the Holy Spirit. The word of God was cast out upon the waters of your life. And the kindly net of the church was let down before you. And it pulled you up out of the depths. Out of the dark, crushing depths of sin. But the difference between you and me and fish is that fish are brought up out of the water into death. But we are brought through water, through holy baptism, into life. Don't be a fish. Don't try and wriggle out of the net. Honestly, don't try and wriggle out of the net of the safety that God gives us in this church because it's going to get caught. It's going to be caught by God. Caught by His Word. Caught by His sacraments. And to live safely in the protective net of the church until the day that we're all in, so to speak, into our eternal and heavenly home. And then out of the joy, I mean out of the joy of being part of all this, being part of Christ's catch, we have the joy, we have the opportunity of catching others and of bringing them into the safety of life with Jesus. From now on, you will be catching men. That is our joyful task together. It's what we gladly get to be about as we go and live out whatever vocation it is that God has given to us. You know, that great commission, go and make disciples, really is better translated as you are going. Make disciples. So as you are going in your lives, in this world, Wherever God has placed you, make disciples. And Jesus tells us exactly how to do that, by baptizing them and teaching them. You know, the work of the church, the mission that we have been given. Isn't that great? What does that entail? <laughs> when they brought their boats to land, they left everything. Followed. You heard about it in the Old Testament lesson today. What did Elisha do when he was called to assist the prophet? It says he killed and boiled his ox. I mean, literally, what did he do? He sacrificed his old wife. He kissed it goodbye and he followed. Following Jesus is an all or nothing thing because the Bible says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now this doesn't mean that you need to become a monk. God has given us a place in this world to be his disciple. We are still in this world. We're just not of it anymore. So i got to ask you this morning, think about this. What boat do you have to leave behind on the shore to fully follow Jesus? What thing is it in this world that is holding you back from fully and faithfully following? What is it you must sacrifice and kiss goodbye? Whatever it is, Jesus says, Peter did that. He left behind everything. He followed after Jesus. But now, later on, though, Peter kind of sinfully said this. Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? You know what Jesus said to that? Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my 
slave will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. We might have to leave behind some things, some people who are keeping us from following Jesus. But Jesus says that we will receive so much more. You might have to leave behind a family member who is pulling you away from Christ. But God says, in this world, I will give you a hundred times more. Look at your family. Look at your family. And you will inherit eternal life. From Jesus, we will have and receive so much more forgiveness, mercy, life, eternal gifts which can neither rust nor decay. We have the joy. We have the joy of being safe in Christ's net of salvation. His nail scarred hands have reached down and have caught us up and brought us into forgiveness and into the love of God. There is nothing for us to be afraid of anymore. And out of joy for being caught up, we are given the privilege of catching others. The privilege of catching others. So what is it that we have learned today? First of all, listen to and follow Jesus' ways. No matter how odd they might sound, because in His ways, there are success. We might be tempted to build the church with our human wisdom, with the flashy ways of this world. Jesus says, cast out into the deep. Do it my way when it seems completely odd from the rest of the world, you don't need flash. You don't need enthusiasm that is fleeting. What you need is water and wine and bread and word and church. To the world, like Paul said in the epistle today, that all might sound like weird stuff. But God promises, do it my way and there will be success. There is no real success in anything else. So we follow him. We follow his seemingly plain but odd ways of water and word and bread and wine, and it will always, always yield the catch. On that day, Peter caught a lot of fish. He needed his friends to come with another boat. They had so many, and they were still sinking. But I tell you what, it was Paul, Peter's simple law and gospel preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost that brought even a greater catch into the church and into salvation. On that one day, doing things Jesus' way, 3,000 souls heard, believed, and were baptized. What how about you guys, but I'm thankful I'm caught. I'm grateful you've been caught too. May we thank God always that we've been caught. And may we never be afraid to live in the safety of Jesus' net of salvation. And may we happily, joyfully, faithfully let down the nets. Let down the nets of God's word, his sacraments, and his church, and catch others for salvation unto eternal life. Fellow fishermen, to that we can say, Amen. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God who passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Having word of the word of God, read and expounded upon, we now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 158. I believe in one God, the Father of all mighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, 
the God is not made. They have one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he was again according to the Scriptures, and the second to heaven. And sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come and make the glory to judge those the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is so by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we end our offerings to the Lord, and I ask that you might ensure your attendance in God's house this morning by signing your name on the path at the end of your feet. Psalm of prayer system in your bulletin for today. You have these special prayer requests. For Ashley Shelton, who has suffered the loss of a baby in her womb, we also pray for Colleen Brun, who had a serious fall and is recovering from them. We pray for Sam Pauzy, who had an injury to his Achilles tendon. Let us rise now to lift our prayers and praise to God our Father. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord our God, you graciously promise to hear us when we cry aloud to you. Fill us, your baptized children, with your spirit that we might be taught your ways and live lives of daily repentance and faith, clinging now and always to the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O Lord our God, you raise up men to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments, which is foolishness to the world, but is your power to save those who by grace hear and receive. So bless all pastors in Christ, especially our synod president, our district president, our circuit visitor, and John Jenkins and Carl Beckwith, our pastors, that they would never tire of preaching Christ crucified to all who hear them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O oh Lord, our God, protect and direct all missionaries, including Reverend Jerry Lawson and his family serving us in Russia, and the Federalist family serving Lutheran Bible translators, that they would be faithful in their sharing of the true gospel to the world, that those who are lost in the darkness of sin and false hope may come to the assurance of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O oh Lord, our God, to provide earthly government to restrain evil and promote good in our world. Bless our president, our governor, and all who make and administer our laws, that they might serve with integrity and honor, and that our nation, which celebrates Independence Day this week, would remain committed to the principles of liberty and justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O Lord, our God, look in mercy upon all those who are sick or who are suffering at this time. For Ashley and her family, as they suffer the loss of a child, for Colleen to give her healing, and for Sam as well. Also, we lift up before you the names of Pam and Kay, Willard and Linda, Cindy, Terry, Joanne, Chris, Faye, Marcia, our homebound Linda, and all of those that we now lift up before you in the silence of our hearts. Comfort them with the same sure and certain knowledge that nothing can take away from them the love that you have for them in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord our God, grant your Holy Spirit to those who come to the Lord's table this day that they may receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ in sincere repentance and firm faith and to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our and to your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We now continue with the service of the sacrament which found what you would find beginning on page 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give 
thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
We rise and sing together the Thank the Lord. Thank you.